Hello and welcome to episode 15 of MMO Weekly, presented as always by MetamorizedOnline.com. I'm your host, Sal Manzo, along with my co-host and executive editor at MMO, Mike Mayer. Mike, I did not have the Mets taking four out of five from the Braves on my bingo card, but here we are. Uh, I think they're seven out of their last eight they've won. Uh, the Mets are rolling. They got a better record than the Yankees and all things good in uh, New York baseball here, Mike. Yeah, you can't ask for much more than what the Mets have done recently. Uh, they are now 15-2 and two since they acquired Daniel Vogelbeck. Uh, yeah, things are going pretty good. Did great in the Braves series to take four out of five and then took care of business when they needed to and swept the Reds. Yep, absolutely. And I know you, you talked about Vogelbach there, so let's get into it. Let's just talk about these acquisitions that the Mets made so far at the deadline. And I think in particular, we're obviously talking about Daniel Vogelbach, uh, Ryan Naquin, and now Darren Ruff, as far as the hitters go. Um, everyone seemed to be contributing a lot. Obviously, Vogelbach was the first guy in the bunch. And I think the Mets are what? Uh, uh, are they 15 and two since he's joined the team or something ridiculous like that? Um, Vogelbass had great at bats, uh, hits a ton, gets on base a lot, has, like I said, really good at bat, walks a lot of good eye, works the pitcher. Um, Naquin's been really good. I think he's got three or four home runs since he's joined the Mets now. Um, looks really good. And Darren Ruff as well. The other day uh, against the Reds, he got that base hit against a righty to bring in a couple of runs. So that was nice to see. I know he's, you know, kind of here to, to, to get, you know, hit off the of lefties, but everyone seems to be contributing out of the new guys. And just how impressed he, or how impressed are you as far as with Epler in the front office and these kind of, you know, you wouldn't call them major deadline moves, right? They're probably bigger splashes that folks maybe wanted, but these guys are, you know, here and they're making big impacts down the stretch now. So I'm just wondering to get your thoughts on it. Yeah, I mean, Vogelback, obviously, they got him a little earlier than the deadline and they, they needed to because they had been getting nothing out of the DH spot. And uh, they needed to get someone in there quickly as possible. And uh, just from the word go, Vogelbach's been getting on base. Um, took a little while, then the power came, and that was shown power. Um, OPS over 1,000. And then Naquin, I mean, Naquin was kind of more of a like depth piece, um, kind of just an upgrade on Travis Janikowski in the outfield, and uh, but has good numbers against righties this year in first career. And... Uh, I think his his power output is a little more shocking because he only had seven home runs coming into the year uh, coming into his play with the Mets, and now he's got three already in such a short period for the Mets, and he's got two triples and two doubles. So I think what he's done has been a really welcome surprise. And then, like you said, Ruff hasn't got a ton of opportunities yet, but when he has, he's got a couple of big hits. And like you mentioned, uh, Buck stayed with him against a righty and came up with a big hit, and he. He also can play some first base, as we've seen, and he can play in the outfield a little bit, too. So Ruff gives uh, Showalter a ton of flexibility. Yeah. And, you know, I guess I'm, I'm kind of curious your thoughts. Obviously, taking four out of five from the Braves was huge. I don't think anybody saw that coming. But are you more impressed with the fact that, you know, the Mets didn't – you kind of thought maybe there was a letdown coming with the Reds coming into town, lesser team. Maybe they kind of play a little below standards there. You know, the air would get loud, let out a little bit. But their foot's on the gas still. You know, they had a great three games. Um, they didn't let up, you know, be obviously beating a team that they're supposed to. But are you surprised at all? There wasn't any let up there, you know, um, you know, from after, you know, that kind of emotional Brave series and, and, and playing them so tough. Were you surprised that they were able to kind of come back and then sweep the Reds too? No, not at all. I mean, this is this is a team, even outside of the manager of Buck Showalter, that's a veteran team. Mm -hmm. Um, they went out and signed a bunch of veterans, they've acquired a bunch of veterans. Uh this is a team that's ready to win. And I mean, they certainly show that in the Braves series. Then, yeah, like you said, that could be, I mean, we've seen Mets teams in the past kind of fall into a trap series with the Reds after that, where they expended all their energy and uh, kind of that was their uh, big series or whatever. And yeah, they were able to not fall into that and take care of the Reds, which, I mean, that's just, that's kind of par for the course of what this Mets team is. I, I think mm -hmm. it's very different than, I mean, with, I haven't talked about it a ton, but I mean, this is, this is one of the best Mets teams I've seen in my uh, lifetime. Um, it could be the best Mets team I've seen in my lifetime. I mean, I was born in 87, so a year after the 86 team. So I can't really compare them to that team. And I don't want to because they won a world series and until we see what happens there. But yeah, I mean, the, the way they've played throughout the season and doing it without DeGrom for most of the year, Scherzer for a good portion of the year 
and kind of missing the pieces that they needed with Vogelback, Naquin, Ruff. Um, yeah, this, this team is – you're kind of at that point where you're like nothing surprises you anymore. Nothing that they do can surprise you. Like when DeGrom – had the perfect game going. It was just one of those seasons where you're like, yeah, he's probably, we're going to probably see another combined no hitter here. And then you almost felt disappointment, but that that's the run they're on right now. That's, that's what they're doing. Everything's exciting. Um, I mean, you saw it in the ballpark when they were playing Atlanta, even with the reds and big hits and stuff. And you see it with the players too. I mean, they know that something special is going on. So uh, yeah, it, it's fun to watch right now. And uh, hopefully it keeps going. Cause they, they are really getting into a rough patch coming up. Yep. Yeah, no, definitely. And you kind of uh, touched on it there as far as it just seems like with this team, you know, every, every time like the brave series, you had a, a five game series there. Everyone was been expecting up oh, there. There's maybe going to stumble here. You know, it's going to be maybe a typical Mets series here and there. And this team just doesn't do it. They don't do it. Um, you know, I know you talked about how this might be the best Mets team you've ever seen. I, I, I feel the same way. I was born in 91, so I missed the, you know, the 86 boat and all that as well. Um, but, you know, I guess the only two teams that I, I think back, obviously, you know, you think of the late 90s Mets. I was a little younger for that. Um, you know, I was more just Mike Piazza was my guy and, and, you know, rooted for the Mets in general. But 2006 and 2015 are the two teams that obviously stick out to me that, you know, made two postseason runs. One of them went to a World Series. Um, you know, I, do, do you think think that this team, you know, per personally, I don't know how you feel. I think that this team is head and, head and shoulders above the 2015 team overall. Um, I think defensively, they're way better. Um, fundamentally, they're way better. You know, their lineup, I think, is much deeper. Obviously, the starting pitching for the, the Mets in 15 was a different story, kind of that. And a couple of guys in the offense carried them there. Um, so, you know, I, I I put the 26 or the 2022 team ahead of them as far as talent-wise. But I'm just kind of curious. Do you think that, that, this, that this 2022 squad, how they would square up to that 06 squad? Because – Lineups, you know, both thump, um, good bullpens, good cl dominant closers. Um, I probably would give the uh, starting pitching edge to this team's Mets. Um, you know, that 06 team, they won 97 games with like Tom Glavin as the best pitcher and Steve Traxel had like 12 wins or something just because they always scored a ton of runs. But, uh, you know, I just think that in general, like this is probably the most well-rounded Mets team I've ever seen. You know, I know you touched on it, but like just they do every single thing well. You know, maybe – the back end of the bullpen might be a little flawed outside of Diaz. You, you know, you don't love it there, but I just like think back to teams in general that we've, you know, gotten to watch that are good and they're not a lot. Um, but this is on the short list of maybe, you know, 86 aside, because like you said, they want, you know, won the world series. You don't compare teams like that to lay, they're able to do it. Um, but just in general, like I, this has to be for me, the best team overall Mets team I've ever seen, you know, day to day in and out. I don't know how you feel if they could, you know, compare to 06 or 15, but you know, as of right now that this team stacks up and then some, I don't know. Yeah. I mean, it, it's tough. Like I said, we are now only what two weeks into having DeGrom and Scherzer together. And, and, and we're going to get to that in just a sec. Yeah. And that's the crazy thing. So they're this many games above 500, the best record since 06. Um, so yeah. And we're only a little bit into Scherzer and DeGrom. I mean, even when the Mets had very good pitching, they didn't DeGrom is uh excuse me, Scherzer is a Hall of Famer. Mm -hmm. And DeGrom, if he stays healthy, is going to be a Hall of Famer. They, it, I mean, they had Johan and Pedro pitching at the same time, but, I mean, Pedro was not Pedro at that point. Yeah. So I, it's tough to compare that, and Johan's not getting in the Hall of Fame. So, I mean, you, you really haven't seen this at the top of the rotation, and that's really, once we get into October, that's really what's going to drive this team in these series is, the ability to throw out Scherzer and Negrom out there. And then, like you said, Diaz. Um, yeah, there's certainly questions beyond Diaz, but when's the last time that the Mets had the surefire best closer in baseball? Right. I mean, certainly Billy Wagner at times was the best closer, but I mean, there was other good closers. The Mariano Rivera was obviously still pitching Trevor Hoffman at times mm -hmm. too. So, but I mean, Diaz is the best closer in baseball right now. I don't, I don't think you can argue that. Um, so you are able to throw out all three of those guys in, in a series and as many innings as possible, hopefully. And it's just, it's crazy to think about what they can do. And it, like you said, there's no slouch on offense. I mean, with Alonzo having a great year, I mean, Lindor is having a fantastic year, which I know we're going to get to. Marte mm -hmm. is having a 
all-star year mcneil having an all-star year nimmo's having a good year and then then you added the bats that they needed and uh yeah this is a deep lineup i mean really right now all they have is still the hole at catcher um offensively and i mean third base isn't great escobar has been underwhelming and giorme while he's been good his, his offense still is uh isn't great for a third baseman so I mean, so you, you really have third base and catcher are really the, the only spots where you have any weakness offensively. So one through seven, I mean, that's given pitchers fits. And the big thing they do is uh, that we saw it the other day. They make the pitchers work. Mm-hmm. Um, we saw it in the Brave series, and we saw it in other series too, where they get the the starting pitchers out early, and you get to the bullpen. And that that's something again that's going to benefit them once they get into the postseason. And uh, managers can only use their bullpen guys so many games in a series. They they don't want to throw those guys every day. So yeah, the, it's a well rounded team. I I I don't I don't really want to pick between them and the other two teams you mentioned. I think that's tough. Still early. I mean, let's talk in October and uh, right, right. But uh, yeah, I mean this this is about it's tough to not get excited about what they can do going forward. You know, real quick, you brought up you are may, I agree with there as far as at third base, it's been in, in general, Esquire's been underwhelming and what you said as far as um, with Guillaume, probably not, you know, offensively much leaps and bounds. What he's turned into is I think he's turned himself into an everyday player, but as far as production wise at third, probably want a little more. Um, but this is him playing second. Have you ever seen a guy with a routine ground ball, at second base, contact play, throw a runner out at home after they double clutch. I've never seen that before in my life. Never in my life. That was extraordinary. What yeah, he does I, with the glove. Oh my goodness. I mean, when you can get basically shocking Keith Hernandez, right? Who has right. seen it all or done it all defensively, right? I mean, yeah. I, I wasn't trying to down Guillaume whatsoever because Guillaume has been great for the Mets, but yeah. I, the things he, it feels like every week there's something that he does defensively where you're just like, you don't see that. It's just because his hands, the way his hand eye coordination works and how quick his hands are, there's few people that have played, uh, that are playing right now and have played for the Mets. I mean, Ray Ardonias is one that comes mm-hmm. to mind a little bit, but even Guillaume is a little bit different in the way he plays defense. Um, it's just, it's just fun to watch. I mean, there's not very many players where you can be like, well, I want to watch him play defense. Like it doesn't happen very often. And specifically with the Mets when they've struggled defensively for a long period of time. So it, he is just incredible to watch that play. Like you said, at third, he made some great plays the other day. And when him and Lindor are turning double plays, beautiful. I, it, it's beautiful to watch. It's just beautiful. Yeah. And, you know, I give credit to McNeil too. Obviously uh, that double play pairing will look, Guillermo Lindoris is probably the best defensive pair up the middle in baseball. I don't care what anybody tells me, but McNeil plays a really good second base. And I, I appreciate the fact that he's able to move around from the outfield back to second and kind of take spells where he needs to. And at least this year, you know, it doesn't affect his offense anymore. And I th- feel like more so maybe it's because guys have more, um, uh, anchored positions within the lineup. Maybe that helps a little bit more. I know for a guy like Marte, they've talked about in the broadcast and stuff. It helps him a lot. No more. He's going to hit every day, but just, you know, I give a lot of credit to McNeil there because wherever he plays defensively, he plays really solid. And, you know, especially for this year, nothing's affected his offense. He's, you know, back to his form. So I wanted to give him credit there when he does play second base. It's also, um, you know, top tier as well. Obviously, Huomer is just kind of another stratosphere with what he does with the glove. Um, but before we kind of, you know, move on to some other things, we, we teased a little DeGrom Scherzer there. Um, obviously we got our first taste of, uh, the back-to-back two-headed monster Cy Young award winners obviously happened during the Braves series. You had Scherzer going, uh, I forget it was the first or the second game during the doubleheader and then the ground the next day on the Sunday, but man, um, you know, you see Scherzer pitch the night before, you know, seven innings doing what he does. He's just been astronomical since he's gotten back from the, the DL. Oh, you know, might get some Cy Young votes out of it. I don't know, because as far as he missed, you know, a decent chunk of time, but the way baseball is now, guys, 150 innings, maybe get you a Cy Young award or whatever. So I think he'll get some votes. He's just been astronomical and just, you know, to ground pitching at home for the first time. And what was it, you know, uh, 390 something days, 400 days, whatever it was. 
electric, electric, just the whole series, but especially when those two guys pitch and then with the ground the next day. Um, SMY, the broadcast, did a tremendous job showing him warm up before the first inning, playing simple man there. That was awesome. Seeing the crowd getting into it. Um, I just – I don't, I, I don't have words for how excited I am now to, to watch this for the rest of the summer and then into October. It's been, we waited a long time for it. It wasn't supposed to be this long, but I would say it's well worth the wait. Um, Scherzer may be the best gun for hire free agent ever. That's a whole, that's another discussion we can get into, but the man just doesn't disappoint when you pay him. He does what he's got to do. And now with these two guys, they're just, you know, leading the charge. I mean, the sky's the limit now. And you think about, you know, the stretch run here in October, the rest of the national league must be shaking in their boots, man. Yeah. I mean, we, we were saying the last time we're on the podcast is like, well, let's see what DeGrom does and try to get like a feel for, I mean, (laughs) he, he made us shut up and prove that he was absolutely fine, uh, more than fine. Uh, Cy Young uh, dominating DeGrom. I mean, he had a perfect game through five innings, and he just he just looked at – I mean, that's as good as his sliders. It's as good as anyone's sliders ever been. Five miles an hour. How is yeah. that possible? Yeah, and he set the, the record for highest whiff rate, yep. 90% whiff rate on a slider, and I just – yeah, it's – it's unhittable. I mean, he he gave, he made one small mistake in an entire outing, and just got burnt on it. But I mean, the, and like I was talking to someone the other day, he had twelve strikeouts and only threw seventy six pitches. That's right, just right. that's not something you see anymore. Nope. Because um, there's a we see a lot big strikeout numbers all the time right. now, but you don't see it that efficient. No. And that's just in speaks to his command. And when Jacob Degrom is commanding his pitches, he's, he's unhittable. And that's what he was. And he, and the crazy thing is he doesn't even need a third or fourth pitch. No, if he's commanding his fastball and slider, that's really all he needs. I mean, he'll toss in a change up and curveball rarely, but he, he doesn't even need those pitches. Nope. And that just speaks to what it is. Like you said, he was hitting 95, actually hit 96 once on a slider and was up wow. to one Oh two on his fastball. I mean, it's just unthinkable to do what he does. And I guess we got kind of lulled into, I mean, it had been been 390 days since we had Mm -hmm. seen him. And there's questions of, well, is he ever going to pitch again? And then is he ever going to pitch for the Mets again? Cause he's going to opt out and what happens with that. But so you get kind of lulled into, well, this might, we might not ever see what DeGrom was before. We might not ever see that again. And I mean, we're, we're seeing it again, um, and hopefully we continue to see it. Um, like you said, him and Scherzer on the stretch run is just – I mean, the Mets aren't going to go into a losing streak, even right. against right. this tough schedule they have coming nope. up with those guys back-to-back. If you lose a game or two, it's, it's just – it's not going to go any further than that because of those two guys. It's – I think – and I forget what it was, the stat. I think DeGrom passed – some sort of strikeout total, I think, with minimum 200 career starts or something like that. He has so he 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 broke some other record. And they told him after the game, he was like, "Oh wow, I didn't know that. That's pretty cool." And it just feels like, obviously, it's been a long time, like you said. But every time Degrom takes the mound, touches the ball, he's breaking some sort of record. Some something that hasn't been done in a in hundred years. He's doing and with regularity. And you know, the thing I've been looking for the last couple of starts, and the first start was a little little off when his. Glove side command, fastball or slider is there. It is the best in baseball, and it is unhittable. If he can pitch to his glove side spot, his fastball and slider, which his last start he did, it was back to that. He's the best in the sport. You might as well go up with there with tennis racket, close your eyes, and say good luck. I've heard, you know, I, I don't know if you've seen interviews. Like I heard uh, from recently, someone Pat, uh, from the Cubs, Cubs, Patrick Wisdom, was talking about the ground. He said it went up and faced him for the first time. He didn't see the ball. He just heard the pop. He was in the <laughs> box. First pitch fastball and went to himself and said, oh boy, I'm in for it. Didn't see it. Just heard the pop. And that's a major league hitters, right? When you make major league hitters, and again, there's only like 750 baseball players, major league baseball players in the whole wide world, right? So when you have professional hitters talking like that, you're just in a different stratosphere. Like, 
I, had, I would imagine, obviously, we're much too young to have seen Sandy Koufax and guys like that, but I would imagine that this is what it, that was and then some because all respect to Sandy Koufax, I'm not talking bad about his game or anything. He was not throwing 96-mile-an-hour sliders and 102-mile-an-hour fastballs and spotting that stuff, glove side, or and, and all around the box. It's just it's he's a video game. I, we've talked about, we were worried he might have to learn how to pitch at 85, 90% and rear back when he was due, you know, when he needs to, but clearly he's one mode it's all in. And when he's healthy and when he can pitch, there's nobody better and right behind them. And if you even call him behind them, I guess he's the grime behind Scherzer, I guess with the way, you know, everything falls. But, and then after that is another hall of fame player, you know, Cy Young award winner in both leagues, total bulldog. And I just, I, I feel like I'm rambling, but just watching the way Scherzer has, has, I guess kind of put his style and like it's rubbed off on the wretch of the pitching staff. Like you hear like Chris Bassett talk the other day and he's just like, I know my role. I'm here to eat innings. That's what I do. I'm helping the bullpen out and it's been successful. And that's why the Mets brought me in. And it just seems like every guy that's on the staff is trying to pitch as long as they can. And, you know, keep obviously keep their team in the game, but just like, it's a competition and they want it. They pick each other up, the pitching staff. I've never seen as far as guys grouping together after every start, huddling around, talking about everything. It's just you talk about one dude making a big difference. And I think Scherzer has proven that. We've talked about it before, but just, you know, besides on the mound, just everything, the, 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 um, the atmosphere around the club, everything. It's just, it's, it's crazy how a couple of moves and, you know, moves for veteran guys like that and the right veterans you can bring in that can totally change the culture of a clubhouse. It's really crazy. Yeah, I mean, they were just talking about it the other day where Carrasco, um, after Scherzer's start on Saturday, he was holding court as he always does, and mm-hmm. he was he was talking about uh, getting behind the ball, and he was Carrasco was talking about how he really took that to heart, and every time he was pitching the other day, he was thinking about that, and specifically when his slider, and he said it's the best the slider's been in such a long time, and he credited Scherzer with that because he really – listened to him and took it to heart. And w- then he went to Scherzer and said, thank you. And Scherzer said, well, for what? <laughs> but, uh, <laughs> but, but that's it because Scherzer does so much talking right. and chatting and going over things with those guys. Like you said, uh, Chris Bassett said earlier this year, he, he's never been around a rotation like this that helps out each other. And Carrasco said the other day, he's never been around a rotation that's any better. And Carrasco pitched in some pretty good rotations there. Yeah. In Cleveland, so yeah, I mean, we talk a lot about Scherzer and Degrom because it's, t- I mean, they're Cy Young winners. But Bassett's been great; he's been pitching deep into games. Carrasco's been great; he's pitching deep into games. And yep. Tywan Walker, even phenomenal outside of that one stinker, he, mm-hmm. he's still been really good. Yep. So I mean, there isn't I there isn't a better rotation in baseball, and that's and then you have David Peterson as the sixth guy who keeps stepping in and pitching great and we'll have to again on a double header soon. So it's yeah. The starting pitching has been anything and everything you could ask for. Absolutely. And another guy, you know, Tyler McGill is not going to be probably in the starting rotation. He'll be in the bullpen when he comes back. You mark my words, a guy like that, that throws that hard going into the bullpen. That's going to be a huge addition for them. Excited to see him in the bullpen down the stretch and hopefully in the postseason too. But I wanted to transition, obviously, talking. I just talked about the bullpen. Um, you know, we're talking about Cy Young guys with Grom and Scherzer. Um, Edwin Diaz is having himself a Cy Young and maybe an MVP caliber season. Uh, I just want to talk to you about how dominant he's been. He uh, he may end up with, what, the best K per nine rate out of any, you know, pitcher, I think, at the end of the year. He's at it right now. I think it's like 19 uh, K per nine or something crazy. Um, the transformation has been, you know, uh, a total 180, obviously, from, you know, the player that they thought they were trading for a few years ago in Seattle. Um, you know, he had some some bruises here. He didn't think he'd be able to get out of it. But, man, so happy he was able to figure it out here. And he seems to really enjoy New York and enjoy the success now. So I just wanted to get your thoughts on, you know, his dominant season. And and I guess, you know, if you think the Mets could uh, be able to keep him at the end after the season. I'm sure, uh, at the, every, every strikeout he gets, that dollar amount keeps going up and up. Yeah, Steve, uh, Steve Cohen even replied to a tweet last week about how he'll have to pay Edwin Diaz till he's a hundred because of what he's doing right now. But yeah, I mean, he's taking the ball in all, all the big spots, the six out save against the Braves. Um, he actually got a reprieve and the red series, yep. which was actually, it was, 
it's good that he got a rest, but also he was pitching against his brother and they had a yeah. ton of family in town. Yep. So yep. N- neither of them pitched, which kind of stunk at least, uh, well, if I'd, one of them pitched, that would have been good. But hopefully the family can come back and see him pitch in October, and that'll kind of make up for it. But, yeah, I, I mean, you're talking about – we were talking about DeGrom's slider. Diaz's slider has been one of the best pitches in baseball. It, it's been unhittable, and he's – the difference this year is the command of it. Mm-hmm. Um, last year, his slider had pretty good movement, and he had the same speed. And the last couple of years, kind of the same thing. And yeah, the last couple of years he's gotten outs with this slider, but this year it's just dominant because he's putting it where he wants to. Right. Um, and that's, that's what's made him one of the best closers of baseball. Not the fact that he's also routinely throwing a hundred and 101 and he's pitching and like he came in the eighth inning and didn't think anything of it. Show Walter knew that was the best spot to put him in. And Diaz came in and, got through the spot because that's when they needed him. And I think, I mean, in the past, that would be kind of a spot where you're like, well, Diaz is going to struggle. And he did, he kind of, he did struggle in non-save situations early in his Mets career. And now he's just relishing the role of being the shutdown guy. It doesn't matter when it is. He's just going to come in and shut down the other team's offense. And uh, you can see it. I mean, it's obvious now to the, now, on the mound, just the confidence level that he's at at this point with the music, the uh, walkout music and everything. And just, it's just, it's just crazy. I mean, the other day when he came out, it was the talk of baseball for like two yeah. days, how electric his uh, walkout was. And it's just, it, it matches what he's doing on the field. So that that's why everyone's excited and happy right. to watch. And like you said, he's sneaking himself into the Cy Young conversation. I mean, I don't think he's going to win Cy Young because right. it's extremely right. rare for you to see a reliever get it. Um, but he's in there. He's in the conversation. He's going to be in the top 10 for sure. He'll get a, he'll get some votes. Yeah. Um, yeah. And like you said, he'll, he'll probably get some MVP votes too, because he's been one of the Mets most important players too. Absolutely. And I think the, uh, you know, at least for me, like what, what I've seen, the, his first couple of years in New York, it felt a lot. He felt he fell uh, behind a lot of hitters 1-0. It felt like, especially you talk about that command of the slider, it wasn't there a lot. And it felt like he was behind hitters a lot and made the fastball hittable. This year, it seems like, you know, outside a couple of situations, I guess, every hitter's 0-1. He's, he's, in, he's ahead of every hitter 0-1, whether it's the slider first pitch or the fastball, he's getting ahead. And I think that has a lot to do with, you know, his confidence and understanding that he can get dudes out. So, you know, um, hopefully this continues. Uh, hopefully he doesn't pull on Armando Benitez and, you know, this is great in the postseason. We got to get there. It's okay. It's okay. Things are good now. We're not getting off the rails. Um, but I guess, uh, you know, I want to kind of transition. We're talking about, uh, you know, Edwin Diaz maybe getting some MVP votes. Francisco Lindor had a tremendous July. Obviously, he broke his finger. What was it? Uh, the end of May. Struggled a bit in June because of it, but he was on fire in July, and he's starting off obviously August the same way. The last, uh, you know, first week and a half here. Um, besides the power, which he just, you know, is, has come there. I think he's got twenty home runs now, or maybe twenty one. Uh, he just with two RBI situation, especially two out RBIs. I don't know if it's because he feels like he doesn't need to do as much now because the lineup is, has lengthened out and he doesn't have to do as much. Where he's just decided, you know, I'm going to put the ball in play and let good things happen and drive runs and do a job. But he's just become so good. And I'm thinking of, I forget if it was yesterday or the day before, it was a two out RBI. He hit the other way. It was a pitch that was off the plate that really he just served into left field. He scored two runs off of it. Um, are you surprised at all that he's, I don't know if surprise is the right word, but, um, you know, that he's turned much more into the player that the Mets expected that they were trading for and signed that big extension. I just kind of want to get your thoughts where, you know, where you're at with him now and, you know, how, how you kind of, you know, evaluate his season so far. Yeah. I mean, he's at five F or, or five war from fan graphs right now, top five in baseball. Wow. Um, yeah. And I mean, this time last year, he was just starting to get hot. Right. So, I mean, before that Mets fans were already talking about his contract, that contract extension that they weren't even into yet being a Mm -hmm. bust. And now we're talking legitimately about him being an MVP candidate. Uh, Right. He's been one of the best players in the national league this year. And uh, yeah, like you said, it's driving in runs. It's hitting for power. He's, he tied the Mets 
a shortstop record for RBIs. Right. Um, he's only three away from the home run record for shortstops for the Mets. Gonna break um, he's the first Met, He's the first Mets shortstop to ever have multiple um, 20 plus home run seasons. Right. Um, yeah. I mean, we're seeing stuff from him that we haven't seen a Mets shortstop do. And yeah, he's one of the best players in the national league. He's one of the best players in baseball right now. Um, he's certainly going to get MVP votes if he keeps this up. And yeah, I, I don't think it's just a hot streak either. I mean, obviously he's, he's hitting really well right now. He's been right. the second best player in baseball since the all-star break behind uh, Nolan Arenado. But uh, this is more of what Francisco Lindor is. I mean, yep. he had a MVP vote season in 2018 with the Indians. Right. So th- yep. this is, and he has the same weighted runs created right now as he did that year. And he's still playing, obviously, the tremendous defense at shortstop. So this is this is what he's capable of. And to see it, I mean, I know the first year overall was kind of a disappointment, but to see him put up this type of season mm-hmm. already in the first year of his extension is uh, it's certainly exciting for the Mets because now he's got all that weight off his back from last year. That That's all gone. Um you're not going to hear any boos anymore, even if he goes into a cold streak and he, he's not going to let that get to his head. Like maybe he had last year. So, I mean, all, right. all that stuff's in the past now. So I think we're, we're seeing Francisco Lindor, the superstar that the Mets traded for. Absolutely. And I, I don't know how you feel. You see, I think the knock on Lindor last year in, in, in general now was like his, his trouble with high velocity, right? Which, Oh, I'm sure everyone struggles with high velocity, but I think in general, the knock on him was he did struggle. He does struggle a bit with higher velo um, on the fastball. It seems like this year. And again, I, it's just something that I'm seeing. I don't know that going with the approach of, you know, not trying to overswing on everything. And, you know, maybe he's, you know, has a little trouble as far as catching up with the higher VO. Um, but he's instead just trying to put the ball and not just put the ball in play, but, you know, take more of a line drive approach, hit the ball hard and put it in play and see what it may. I don't know if you've seen that, but it seems like that has, and it seems to be another reason why he's had a bit more success. I think last year he overswung a lot, especially at the higher VLO pitchers. And he was getting out up with the fastball. And it seems like now he's just, you know, focusing more on getting the barrel to the ball, getting hit, you know, hard barrels and kind of letting the chips fall where they may. And that's what it seems like, you know, another reason why he's having, you know, a huge bounce back year. Oh, absolutely. And I think he's just simply laying off that pitch a little Mm -hmm. bit more. And when he does swing at the higher fastball, he is, he's a little shorter to the ball. So he's making more contact. And like you said the other day, when he had that hit the left field, um, that, that type of thing where he, he's a little shorter, a little quicker, and he's able to put that ball in play. It might not be with a ton of power, but at least, especially in an RBI situation, he's putting the ball in play. And that's obvious. I mean, He's been one of the best RBI guys in baseball this year, too. So, yeah, I mean, that's that's something you love to see from him, especially so his has a high on base in front of Alonzo, who's having a monster year. It feels weird that we can talk about how good this team is and talk about all the individuals between DeGrom, Scherzer, Diaz, um, the acquisitions, and Lindor, and then you – Alonzo's second in the big leagues in RBI, and yep. we, we, we're just now getting to him, but that that's how good this Mets team is. Um, Alonzo's having a monster year. I mean, he's having – it could be close to what he did in his rookie season. It won't be the home run total, right. but the offensive value yep. could be right about there, could be above there. Um, he's just having a fantastic year too, and he's another – like you said, I think he's been a little shorter to the ball at mm-hmm. times too. Um, he's actually – one thing I found interesting when I was looking at uh, his power numbers and his just overall numbers because of he was having a career year actually right. in a lot of offensive categories is that, is that he's actually pulling the ball more this year. Oh, wow. Which, which I think is interesting because whenever – like you watch a Mets broadcast and um, – Keith Hernandez is talking about a guy doing well. He he sees it from a standpoint of well, they're going the other way. way. Yep, yep. I mean, that's the type of hitter Keith Hernandez. Was. Right, right. That, that's not necessarily the type of hitter everyone else is, and it's it's not really the type of hitter Pete Alonso is. Right. Um, he does have power the other way, but when Pete Alonso is doing really well, it's he has the ability to pull any pitch with power. Right. right. I, I think that's kind of what separates him 
him, Aaron Judge, and a couple of other guys power-wise from anyone else is the ability to pull just about any ball with power. And um, Alonzo's shown that this year. He's he's just been fantastic um, putting those balls in play that he wasn't last year. I mean, he's not yeah. striking out that much at all for no. the type of slugger that he is. Well, that's what he – and he's spoken about it, right? The thing that he really worked on was his plate discipline and understanding – that, you know, working with, and, and credit to Eric Chavez and the whole staff, because obviously this has, they you know, the whole lineup has their fingerprints all over it. It's a, just, all, you know, as far as the, it's, we talk about Lindor, like that serving that pitch there, it's just keeping the line moving. It's, it's not sexy baseball, right? But it's winning baseball. This is what winning lineups do. You turn it over to the next guy, to the next guy, to the next guy. If you put the ball in play, if you don't strike out, good things happen. You know what I mean? It's it's an old adage. It's it's kind of boring. It's the quote unquote, I guess, more old school kind of way now. But good things happen when you put the ball in play, force the defense to make plays, and hit in line drives. And I think the biggest thing for Pete talked about was being able to lay off those tougher pitches working his walks up more and would make him an MVP candidate. And clearly it has, you know, the average is close up to 280, which is tremendous. You know, the on base, I think is like what, 360, 350, something like that. Maybe a little more. Um, you know, he understands that he's only going to get maybe one or two pitches in that bat that he can drive, that he can work with. And it's either attacking that pitch when you get it and being able to lay off the stuff that you can't and maybe taking that walk and keep it to the next person. Cause you know, he's going to get pitch tougher than everyone else in that lineup. Cause he's a slugger, but you know, it's just a, a credit to him. It's funny. Uh, he doesn't have a hit the first two games in, of the red series. They won both games. You know, it's just how deep that lineup is. And like you said, it's a, it's a credit to, you know, what they've put together there. Um, when guys like that can scuffle, because in the past, Pete was a main cog. And if he scuffled, especially last year, the Mets offense went nowhere. So, uh, you know, credit to, to the rest of the lineup for being able to, you know, pick, pick each other up and score, you know, find different ways to score runs. Um, but I guess I want to transition kind of from the guys that are playing now to uh, some old timers. Um, the Mets did announce their old timers day roster uh, that's coming up on the 27th. Uh, just thoughts quick on that. Um, any surprising names or anything like that? Will we see like 25 pitchers that these guys could be able to throw like an inning? Um, I wonder what Keith's going to do. We're going to get him in some stirrups. I don't know. Maybe we'll get, you know, if he can uh, swing the bat there. It should be pretty fun. Pretty fun day, though. I feel like Jose Reyes is going to run around everybody because he's like the youngest guy by a lot. But I guess we'll see. Yeah, I mean, I I really don't have any expectations because I really, other than watching like stuff on YouTube, right. I have nothing to go by on this. So I'm just excited to see it. Um, yeah. I mean, a pretty good group of guys that they were able to get there. There was some surprises, but you just, you just never know with like people's situation and stuff. I know everyone was talking about David Wright, but he, he already said earlier this year that he doesn't feel like he's an old timer. Right. And he kind of already had some stuff going on. So it just wasn't right for him to do it this year. Um, there was some other uh, – there was an April Fool's thing earlier this year about Yoenis Cespedes, 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 yeah. Cespedes playing. Um, and Cespedes is active technically because he's going to play in winter ball he's this year. He's going to play winter ball, yep. So uh, – although Bartolo colon has been active too and he, he's still <laughs> coming. So I think Bart, I think Bart's coming because he thinks this is an audition to still – It's a tryout. Yeah, I think he thinks it's a tryout. Uh, one of the – so like Carlos Delgado, uh, John Olerud, um, those are a couple of names that I was kind of uh, – R.A. Dickey. That's um, cool. Th there was a couple – no, those are the ones not coming. Not so, coming. Yeah, so those three were kind of the ones that stood out to me that I was a little surprised. But, yeah, again, you just don't – you don't know like where guys – because we don't see or hear from some of these guys. Like right. the last time you saw or heard from John Olerud. So right. who who knows how he is like playing capability right. wise. Right. Um, but yeah, I mean, I like there could be something fun, like seeing Ron Darling pitch against like Keith Hernandez, yep. something like that. Something like that would be terrific to see. Yeah. Um, yeah it's, it's going to be a lot of fun. I mean, seeing Johan Santana pitch the Josh Tolley again, that type of thing. Um, yeah. You think, the, you think Terry leaves a pitcher in too long for this? Yeah. Time? I, I think it's very likely that Terry <laughs> leaves a pitcher in too long. Uh, yeah. Too bad. He doesn't like have Harvey there to leave him in. But uh, what, uh, what one I did find kind of odd was Joe Torrey. I saw that. I got, he managed the Mets. He's still yeah. Alive. Yeah. He's still alive. He, I don't yeah, know. Yeah. You just, it's, that was like one of the ones the most you're just seeing. You're like, you don't really equate. 
I mean, especially we're younger, but right. I, even I saw some of the older fans commenting like, well, they, they equated them with the Mets, but they didn't want to. Right. So <laughs> that, that was one of the like weird ones for me, but uh, other guys like Todd Hunley, uh, nice to see him. I, I don't remember the last time I saw a T- Todd Hunley on a TV or anything like that. So it, it's cool to see those guys, Benny Agbiani. I was pretty, I, I mean, you got to be a diehard Mets fan, but oh, yeah. I was super excited when I saw him on the list. I'm like, whoa, Benny Agbiani, like that's cool. And like Jay Payton, like when's yep. the last time you thought about Jay Payton? So just to get all those guys together and uh, play some baseball. And I mean, whatever happens, it, it'll be fun to watch. Exactly. No, it's, it's cool. The Mets are doing that. It's, it's awesome that, you know, the, the Cohen administration is embracing, you know, the history of the Mets and, and bringing that to life and uh, only makes them more money, brings more fans to the ballparks. Win win for everybody, man. Hopefully it'd be fun. I think they only play in like two innings or something like that. Probably, probably can only get the pitches to last enough. You know what I mean? I don't know. It's a couple innings, but that'll be fun. It'll be cool. Um, seeing everybody in uniform, they'll be, I'm sure all have a blast. Although I feel like Keith Hernandez is someone that doesn't like looking bad at something. No, so I, yeah, yeah. So I wonder how that's gonna go. If he takes one <laughs> at bat and he and he's not he's not touching, he may take himself out. And so you know, going back to the booth. Forget this. Yeah, I mean, yeah, like you said, he's a, he's a pride guy, a lot of pride in what he does. So I'm sure, and I mean, he he's I mean, they've talked about it. He's had some injuries since he played too. He's had some surgery since he played. So yeah, yeah it'll the, be the kind shrub of incident last year. Poor guy almost lost his toe. Yeah, yeah. So. uh who who knows how uh, good he'll look over there at first? It'll it'll be a shell of himself that we saw in his playing days. But yeah, I think one of the coolest things is going to be at four thirty that day is like when they're doing the player introductions, right. so that all those guys can get introduced one another time as a Met and everything. I think that's what fans will really like, and I think a lot of the players will enjoy. And I think that's a lot of reason uh, some of those guys have come back because I mean. There's just, I mean, it's quite an extensive list of who's playing. Yep. And the last thing I got for you before we go, obviously Vince Scully passed away last week at 94, obviously the greatest broadcaster of all time. But now that he's passed away, I saw this on Twitter and I I'm, I'm, want to get your take. Is Gary Cohen now the greatest living baseball broadcaster? Because I know my answer to that. I'm curious what your answer is. Yeah, I mean – there's obviously some guys that have been doing it longer. Um, I'm not sure there's anyone that's been that's better at what he does, uh, and that's not really being biased. I mean, they've done they've done polls on this like nationwide and stuff, and the Mets have always finished in the top five. And I mean, Gary Cohen's a big part of why they're finishing in the top five. So, I mean, yeah, who am I to say he's not? I guess is the best way. Exactly. It's a strong yes. And I say that, I guess, biasly. As Met fans, the last 15 years, there's been not a lot of reason to watch Mets baseball for a bulk of it. He's the reason why. Gary, Keith, and Ron together, but he's the main cog why. He is the greatest living baseball broadcaster in America. I don't care. I'll take. I'll fight that anybody. Watch a Met game. Watch the Mets in 2011 like we did in June, July, yes. August when they were 20 games out. You're watching it for a reason because you're watching those three guys call a ball game. And Gary's the best at it. Um, I just thought that was interesting. I want to get your take. But uh, I think we'll end it there. Uh, obviously, we've got a big series coming up here. Tough stretch for the Mets, like you said, Mike. Uh, we'll preview everything next week or recap everything next week after uh, the series ends. Um, with Philly this weekend, but you know, until then, hopefully more winning and let's go Mets guys.